The Bold Dragoon, or The Adventure of My Grandfather, by Washington Irving. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Bold Dragoon by Washington Irving My grandfather was a bold dragoon, for it's a profession, do you see, that has run in the family. All my forefathers have been dragoons and died upon the field of honour except myself. And I hope my posterity may be able to say the same. However, I don't mean to be vainglorious. Well, my grandfather, as I said, was a bold dragoon and had served in the Low Countries. In fact, he was one of that very army which, according to my uncle Toby, swore so terribly in Flanders. He could swear a good stick himself, and, moreover, was the very man that introduced the doctrine Corporal Trim mentions of radical heat and radical moisture, or, in other words, the mode of keeping out the dams of ditch water by burnt brandy. Be that as it may, it's nothing to the purport of my story. I only tell it to show you that my grandfather was a man not easily to be humbugged. He had seen service, or, according to his own phrase, he had seen the devil, and that's saying everything. Well, gentlemen, my grandfather was on his way to England, for which he intended to embark at Ostend. Bad luck to the place for one where I was kept by storms and headwinds, for three long days, and the devil of a jolly companion or pretty face to comfort me. Well, as I was saying, my grandfather was on his way to England, or rather to Ostend, no matter which, it's all the same. So one evening, toward nightfall, he rode jollily into Bruges. Very like you all know Bruges, gentlemen of a queer, old-fashioned Flemish town, once, they say, a great place for trade and money-making. In old times, when the mineers were in their glory. But almost as large and as empty as an Irishman's pocket at the present day. Well, gentlemen, it was the time of the annual fair. All Bruges was crowded, and the canals swarmed with Dutch boats, and the streets swarmed with Dutch merchants, and... Well, there was hardly any getting along for goods, wares, and merchandises, and peasants in big breeches, and women in a half a score of petticoats. My grandfather rode jollily along in his easy, slashing way, for he was a saucy, sunshiny fellow, staring about him at the motley crowd, and the old houses with gable ends to the streets and storks' nests on the chimneys winking at your vrous who showed their faces at the windows, and joking the women right and left in the street, all of whom laughed and took it in amazing good part. For though he did not know a word of their language, yet he always had a knack of making himself understood among the women. Well, gentlemen, it being the time of the annual fair, all the crown was crowded, every inn and tavern full, as my grandfather applied in vain from one to the other for admittance. At length he rode up to an old rackety inn that looked ready to fall to pieces, and which all the rats would have run away from if they could have found room in any other house to put their heads. It was just such a queer building as you see in Dutch pictures, with a tall roof that reached up into the clouds, and as many garrets one over the other as the seven heavens of Mohammed. Nothing had saved it from tumbling down but a stork's nest on the chimney, which always brings good luck to a house in the low countries. And at the very time of my grandfather's arrival, there were but two of these long-legged birds of grace standing like ghosts on the chimney top. Faith, but they've kept the house on its legs to this very day for you may see it at any time you pass through Bruges, as it stands there yet, only it is turned into a brewery, 
a brewery of strong Flemish beer. At least it was so when I came that way after the Battle of Waterloo. My grandfather eyed the house curiously as he approached. It might not altogether have struck his fancy had he not seen in large letters over the door, Here were cooped, man good and drunk. My grandfather had learnt enough of the language to know that the sign promised good liquor. This is the house for me, said he, stopping short before the door. The sudden appearance of a dashing dragoon was an event in an old inn frequented only by the peaceful sons of traffic. A rich burgher at Antwerp, a stately ample man in a broad Flemish hat, who was the great man and great patron of the establishment, sat smoking a clean long pipe on one side of the door. A fat little distiller of Geneva from Shayadam sat smoking on the door, and a comely hostess in crimped cap beside him, and the hostess's daughter, a plump Flanders lass with long gold pendants in her ears, was at a side window. Humph! said the rich burgher of Antwerp, with a sulky glance at the stranger. "'Der Duivel, said the fat little distiller of Shiredown. The landlord saw, with the quick glance of a publican, that the new guest was not at all, at all, to the taste of the old ones. And, to tell the truth, he did not himself like my grandfather's saucy eye. He shook his head. Not a garret in the house, but was full. "'Not a garret,' echoed the landlady. "'Not a garret,' echoed the daughter. The burgher of Antwerp and the little distiller of Shiredam continued to smoke their pipes sullenly, eyeing the enemy askance from under their broad hats, but said nothing. My grandfather was not a man to be browbeaten. He threw the reins on his horse's neck, cocked his hat on one side, stuck one arm akimbo, slapped the broad thigh with the other hand. "'Faith and troth,' said he, "'but I'll sleep in this house this very night.' My grandfather had on a tight pair of buckskins. The slap went to the landlady's heart. He followed up the wow by jumping off his horse and making his way past the staring mine ears into the public room. "'Maybe you've been in the bar-room of an old Flemish inn,' Faith, but a handsome chamber it was as you'd wish to see. With a brick floor, a great fireplace, with a whole Bible history in glazed tiles. And then the mantelpiece, pitching itself head foremost out of the wall, with a whole regiment of cracked teapots and earthen jugs paraded on it, not to mention half a dozen great delf platters hung about the room by way of pictures and the little bar in one corner, and the bouncing barmaid inside of it with a red calico cap and yellow eardrops. My grandfather snapped his fingers over his head as he cast an eye round the room. Fate! This is the very house I've been looking after, said he. There was some farther show of resistance on the part of the garrison, but my grandfather was an old soldier and an Irishman to boot, and not easily repulsed, especially after he had got into the fortress. So he blarneyed the landlord, kissed the landlord's wife, tickled the landlord's daughter, chucked the barmaid under the chin, and it was agreed on all hands that it would be a thousand pities and a burning shame into the bargain to turn such a bold ragoon into the streets. So they laid their heads together, that is to say my grandfather and the landlady, and it was at length agreed to accommodate him with an old chamber that had for some time been shut up. "'Some say it's haunted,' whispered the landlord's daughter. "'But you're a bold dragoon, and I say you don't fear ghosts.' "'The devil a bit,' said my grandfather, pinching her plump cheek. "'But if I should be troubled by ghosts, I've been to the Red Sea in my time, and—' Have a pleasant way of laying them, my darling. My darling. And then he whispered something to the girl which made her laugh and give him a good-humoured box in the ear. In short, 
there was nobody knew better how to make his way among the petticoats than my grandfather. In a little while, as was his usual way, he took complete possession of the house, swaggering all over it, into the stable to look after his horse, into the kitchen to look after his supper. He had something to say or do with everyone, smoked with the Dutchman, drank with the Germans, slapped the men on the shoulders, tickled the women under the ribs. Never since the day of Ali Croker had such a rattling blade been seen. The landlord stared at him with astonishment. The landlord's daughter hung her head and giggled whenever he came near. And as he turned his back and swaggered along, his tight jacket setting off his broad shoulders and plump buckskins and his long sword trailing by his side, the maids whispered to one another, What a proper man! At supper my grandfather took command of the table d'hôte, as though he had been at home, helped everybody, not forgetting himself, talked with everyone, whether he understood their language or not and made his way into the intimacy of the rich burgher of Antwerp, who had never been known to be sociable with anyone during his life. In fact, he revolutionized the whole establishment, and gave it such a rouse that the very house reeled with it. He outsat everyone at table excepting the little fat distiller of Shiredam, who had sat soaking for a long time before he broke forth. But when he did, he was a very devil incarnate. He took a violent affection for my grandfather. So they sat drinking and smoking and telling stories and singing Dutch and Irish songs without understanding a word each other said, until the little Hollander was fairly swamped with his own gin and water and carried off to bed, whooping and hiccuping and trolling the burthen of a low Dutch love song. Well, gentlemen, my grandfather was shown to his quarters, a huge staircase composed of loads of hewn timber, and through long rigmarole passages hung with blackened paintings of fruit and fish and game and country frolics and huge kitchens and portly burgomasters, such as you see about old-fashioned Flemish inns, till at length he arrived at his room. An old times chamber it was, sure enough, and crowded with all kinds of trumpery. It looked like an infirmary for decayed and superannuated furniture, where everything diseased and disabled was sent to nurse, or to be forgotten. Or rather, it might have been taken for a general congress of old legitimate movables, where every kind and country had a representative. No two chairs were alike. Such high backs and low backs and leather bottoms and worsted bottoms and straw bottoms and no bottoms and, and cracked marble tables with curiously carved legs holding balls in their claws as though they were going to play at ninepins. My grandfather made a bow to the motley assemblage as he entered and having undressed himself placed his light in the fireplace asking pardon of the tongs seemed to be making love to the shovel in the chimney corner and whispering soft nonsense in its ear. The rest of the guests were by this time sound asleep, for your mine ears are huge sleepers. The housemaids, one by one, crept up yawning to their attics, and not a female head in the inn was laid on a pillow that night without dreaming of the bold dragoon. My grandfather, for his part, got into bed and drew over him one of those great bags of down under which they smother a man in the low countries. And there he lay, melting between two feather beds, like an anchovy sandwich between two slices of toast and butter. He was a warm-complexioned man, and this smothering played the very deuce with him. So, Sure enough, in a little while it seemed as if a legion of imps were twitching at him and all the blood in his veins was in fever heat. He lay still, however, until all the house was quiet, except the snoring of the mineers from the different chambers, who answered one another in all kinds of tones and cadences like so many bullfrogs in a swamp. The quieter the house became, the more unquiet became my grandfather. He waxed warmer and warmer until at length the bed became too hot to hold him. Maybe the maid has warmed it too much, said the curious gentleman inquiringly. 
"'I'd rather think the contrary,' replied the Irishman. "'But, be that as it may, it grew too hot for my grandfather. "'Faith, there's no standing this any longer,' says he. "'So he jumped out of bed and went strolling about the house. "'What for?' said the inquisitive gentleman. "'Why, to cool himself, to be sure,' replied the other. "'Or perhaps to find a more comfortable bed, or perhaps... "'But no matter what he went for, he never mentioned, "'and there's no use in taking up our time in conjecturing. "'Well, my grandfather had been for some time absent from his room "'and was returning perfectly cool. "'When just as he reached the door, he heard a strange noise within. "'He paused and listened. "'It seemed as if someone was trying to hum a tune in defiance of the asthma. "'He recollected the report of the rooms being haunted, "'but he was no believer in ghosts. "'So he pushed the door gently ajar and peeped in. "'Egad, gentlemen, there was a gamble carrying on within "'enough to have astonished St. Anthony. "'By the light of the fire he saw a pale, weazen-faced fellow "'in a long flannel gown and a tall white nightcap with a tassel to it, "'who sat by the fire with a bellows under his arm by way of bagpipe, "'from which he forced the asthmatical music that had bothered my grandfather.' As he played, too, he kept twitching about with a thousand queer contortions, nodding his head and bobbing about his tassel nightcap. My grandfather thought this very odd and mighty presumptuous, and was about to demand what a business he had to play his wind instruments in another gentleman's quarters, when a new cause of astonishment met his eye. From the opposite side of the room a long-backed, bandy-legged chair, covered with leather and studded all over in a coxcomical fashion with little brass nails, got suddenly into motion, thrust out first a claw foot, then a crooked arm, and at length, making a leg, slided gracefully up to an easy chair of tarnished brocade, with a hole in its bottom, and led it gallantly out in a ghostly minuet about the floor. The musician now played fiercer and fiercer and bobbed his head and his nightcap about like mad. By degrees, the dancing mania seemed to seize upon all the other pieces of furniture. The antique long-bodied chairs paired off in couples and led down a country dance. A three-legged stool danced a hornpipe, though horribly puzzled by its supernumerary leg while the amorphous tong seized the shovel round the waist and whirled it about the room in a German waltz. In short, all the movables got in motion, capering about, pirouetting, hands across, right and left, like so many devils, all except a great clothes-press, which kept curtsying and curtsying like a dowager, in one corner, in exquisite time to the music being either too corpulent to dance or perhaps at a loss for a partner. My grandfather concluded the latter to be the reason. So, being like a true Irishman devoted to the sex and at all times ready for a frolic, he bounced into the room calling to the musician to strike up Paddy O'Rafferty, capered up to the clothes press and seized upon two handles to lead her out. When, whiz, the whole revel was at an end. The chairs, tables, tongs, and shovels slunk in an instant as quietly into their places as if nothing had happened. And the musician vanished up the chimney, leaving the bellows behind him in a hurry. My grandfather found himself seated in the middle of the floor, with the clothes press sprawling before him, and the two handles jerked off and in his hands. Then, after all, this was a mere dream, said the inquisitive gentleman. "'The devil a bit of a dream,' replied the Irishman. "'There never was a truer fact in this world. "'Faith, I should have liked to see any man tell my grandfather it was a dream. "'Well, gentlemen, as the clothes press was a mighty heavy body, "'and my grandfather likewise, particularly in rear, "'you may easily suppose two such heavy bodies coming to the ground "'would make one bit of a noise. "'Faith!' The old mansion shook as though it had mistaken it for an earthquake. The whole garrison was alarmed. The landlord who slept just below hurried up with a candle to inquire the cause. 
but with all his haste his daughter had hurried to the scene of uproar before him. The landlord was followed by the landlady, who was followed by the bouncing barmaid, who was followed by the simpering chambermaids, all holding together as well as they could such garments as they had first lain hands on, but all in a terrible hurry to see what the devil was to pay the chamber of the bold dragoon. My grandfather related the marvellous scene he had witnessed and the prostrate clothes press and the broken handles bore testimony to the fact. There was no contesting such evidence, particularly with a lad of my grandfather's complexion, who seemed able to make good every word either with sword or shillelagh. So the landlord scratched his head and looked silly, as he was apt to do when puzzled. The landlady scratched, oh, she did not scratch her head, but she knit her brow, and did not seem half pleased with the explanation. But the landlady's daughter corroborated it by recollecting that the last person who had dwelt in the chamber was a famous juggler who had died of St. Vitus's dance and no doubt had infected all the furniture. This set all things to right, particularly when the chambermaids declared that they all had witnessed strange carryings on in that room and as they declared this upon their honours, they could not remain a doubt upon the subject. "'And did your grandfather go to bed again in that room?' said the inquisitive gentleman. "'That's more than I can tell. Where he passed the rest of the night was a secret he never disclosed. In fact, though he had seen much service, he was but indifferently acquainted with geography, and apt to make blunders in his travels about inns at night, that it would have puzzled him sadly to account for in the morning. "'Was he ever apt to walk in his sleep?' said the knowing gentleman. "'Never that I heard of.'" End of The Bow Dragoon, or The Adventure of My Grandfather, by Washington Irving. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama.